This should be a fun project. We've got a parts list for the Pet SD Plus version 2.4. See what's in the package. Components, more components. Chips, power cable, sockets, uh, IEEE connector, chips and a chip and a socket. There's the main board. And yeah. There's the display. Well there's all the parts laid out. And over the next few days or so I will attempt to assemble this into a working SD card reader for the pet. Looks like it's mostly or all through hole components. I was expecting to see some surface mount parts but not really seeing any except maybe the uh, SD card socket. Well I've gone through the parts list here and inventoried everything. Everything appears to be here. Unfortunately for version 2.4, the comprehensive assembly instructions are not yet available, coming soon. So, all we have to go by are the schematics. So I'm going to see if I can't uh, cobble this thing together using the schematics and what's printed on the silkscreen on the board. I've got the camera repositioned here so that hopefully I won't get in the way. Got the components all laid out. And uh, without instructions, I just have to kind of wing it here. So I'm going to start by putting in all the resistors and then I'll uh, pop the capacitors and other discrete components in there. And then we'll work on chip sockets and uh, other components after that. So screen has a lot of detail on it. I can see uh, R6, R8, R9, R4. And the uh, resistors came on this paper pack here. Tell you which resistors which R6, R7, R8, R9. So, I'm just going to start placing those and soldering them in. That's R7. R10 is a special case because of the display that I ordered. I was told that R10 is just a jumper wire, no resistor. So all I have to do is fashion some of the lead cut off from the R7. See if I can get it to uh, fit in there straight. Two resistors done. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight more to go. That's all the resistors. R1, 2, 3, 4. I believe this is R5. And then 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. We have two electrolytic capacitors, C16 and C17. Next up are three 1 microfarad ceramic capacitors. C13 through C15. Nine 100 nanofarad ceramic capacitors, C3 through C11. Two 18 picofarad capacitors, C1 and C2. That seems that's it for the capacitors. 
you have a couple of inductors and a couple of diodes and this is crystal X1 16 megahertz L1 and L2 here are uh, 10 microhenry inductors D4 and D5 are right here these are shot key diodes next up is IC7 I don't know if the camera can make this out but uh, this is a voltage regulator and transistor Q1 goes right here a couple of notes before moving on the silk screen on this board is done very well so it's going to be hard to put anything in backwards but you got to make sure you have the orientation of your electrolytic capacitors and your diodes correct the uh, voltage regulator and the transistor those are uh, obvious from the silk screen the rest of the components are not polarized until we get to these resistor packs this is a six position resistor pack and a four position resistor pack and these have a dot on one end so we just got to make sure the dot goes uh, and again silk screen is obvious indicating which end is the common RR1, the six position pack, goes up here. A wad of blue tack adhesive, like this, is good for holding components in place while you solder them. That's most of the discrete components. I'm going to start working on chip sockets now. And again, some blue tack will help hold that socket in place while soldering. That's all of the sockets. Next up is something called a chrono dot. There are a couple of spaces on the silk screen here for some resistors on this, uh, but none were included. I'm going to assume they're not needed. The silk screen shows a smaller circle on this side, so I assume that's where the button cell goes. So checking the schematic, this is the correct orientation. Reset here and ground and VCC here. few seconds for these header pins to actually heat up. I may have made a mistake. I think I should have put the uh, SD card slot in first because there's going to be a pad right here that's going to be troublesome. This is surface mount. It's going to be a little tricky. There's some alignment holes and the surface mount pads there in the back. So for surface mount parts, I like to use liquid flux. A lot of you may not agree, but it helps the solder to wet much quicker and uh, gets the parts where they need to be locked in. So keep a little needle dropper here with some liquid flux. And we just want the tiniest drop. And of course, it's dried out and clogged up. This stuff is kind of nasty, actually. Just want to put the tiniest little drop on the pads. And we'll place the part. And I'm going to solder right here on the sides to attach it down to these pads. One of the things that the liquid flux does is just allow the solder to wet very quickly without having to feed any. Just so. Just put a blob on the end of the tip and touch it there long enough to heat it up. I'm going to try to get in here on these contacts between the socket there. Might get my head in the way here with my magnifying glasses. Should have done this before. Of 
putting the socket and the uh, chrono dot in place. Hopefully that's good. Visual inspection says all those contacts have wetted. I'm not really sure whether the sockets or the pin headers are supposed to go on the board or on the display, but I did it this way. Should work out. There's a reset switch that goes on the back, an IEC connector and an IEEE connector. Got the fan on when I'm doing a lot of pins in a row here just to keep the fumes from accumulating in my lungs. Blue tack to hold the part in place. Go for the bigger solder. That's all of the connectors on the rear panel. Power, IEEE, IEC, reset button. I'm running out of uh, parts to install. We've got three LEDs, red, green, and yellow. These are the LEDs that came with the uh, unit, but these are the ones I'm going to install. These came with the case that I plan to put it in. This is the case here. It's designed to look like a Commodore dual floppy drive. Let's see, this is labeled D3, D1, and D2. According to the parts list, D1 is red. That's the error LED, that makes sense. D2 is green. That's the busy LED. D3 is yellow. which is the power light. Next up are the switches. These don't appear to have any particular orientation. The, uh, the legs are shaped to spring out and hold them in place. Previous, next, and select. These switches are interesting in that they, uh, they push straight down, but they also you can also push them sideways to make the connection. And that's important. Uh, that's going to come in handy with the case, as you'll see later if the case works out. Get them to line up here. Two screws in the display there just to make sure it's aligned right. I suppose we might as well put the chips in their sockets. This is an AT Mega. Should be oriented this way. There's a capacitor over here that's just in the way. An AT Tiny. AT Tiny 45. This is a 75160, which should be IC2. And the silk screen is labeled here 75160. The chip orientation in this direction. Next up, we have a 75161 
IC3. I can see the soak screen here, 75, 161. This is oriented the other way. Don't force it. Make sure all the pins are lined up with the holes before you press down. There we go. Now we have a 4050 and a 74HCT125. This is the 4050 oriented in this direction. Need to uh, rock these legs to bend them inward. I don't know why the factories make them bent out like that. Probably helps the machines put them together. Don't want to line up. There it is. Only one left. HCT-125. There. The battery in the clock module. The kit included the battery. Push that in right there. The display on. Press down, put the screws in. The system came with a kit to tap the 5 volts off of the cassette port, but I don't actually want to use that. So I'm going to use this barrel connector and tie this into a regular USB power supply. For this, I need to sacrifice a USB cable, but I got so many of these damn things laying around that it's not really much of a sacrifice. I've cut back the outer insulation and stripped the red and the black wires. I think these are the 5 volts, but I'm going to test to find out. I've got that USB cable plugged into a USB power supply and hooked up to the multimeter. Let's see what we're getting. Looks like 5.1 volts. Heat shrink over that. Outer heat shrink over all of it. Looks like it's just long enough. Well, here goes nothing. Let's see what happens when we turn it on. We got some lights, we got a power light. And a busy light. No display. So it turns out it works just fine. Everything was put together right. Uh, I just ran into a rare glitch that I'll explain to you in a minute. You can see here the software is still in alpha. This is the latest version from October of last year. Well, this is what was happening. On power on or reset, you get the lights flashing in this pattern and the display never comes on. I emailed Dave at primrosebank.net back and forth a few times and he figured out that when it does this, it indicates that the bootloader is running and attempting to start the application but failing or the application is starting and crashing uh, before it initializes the display. He's not sure if this is a problem with the firmware or maybe a problem with component tolerances. In any case, this is not something that you'll run into if you buy a pre-assembled and tested unit. Hopefully this is something that can be fixed with a firmware update in the future. Uh, in any case, not many people are going to run into this uh, as is. If you do run into this, as I did, there is a workaround. To 
get around this, when you power on or reset, you need to press the reset button again rather quickly while all three lights are on. And this is nearly impossible to do normally. So the trick is to put a firmware file on an SD card and insert that. If there's a firmware update file on there, even if it's the same version, the bootloader takes a second to examine the file to see if it's a newer version. And that gives you an extra second or two to press the reset button. Now the system will boot. So just something to keep in mind if you do run into this, which you probably won't. I'll throw a link in the description to the web page that describes this issue and the workaround. There's an adjustment screw right over here in the corner to adjust the display contrast. This display is very dependent on the viewing angle. So there are certain angles where you really can't see it at all. This is to give you an idea of the display's viewing angle. From above, as you come down, it gets very dim until you get down to about here and then it brightens up again. If we press select here, we can get into the menus. One of the options is to change the device number. So you can go 8, 9, 10, 11, save settings. You can set the clock, which is currently set to the correct date and time. Uh, next previous on each one, select moves you to the next field. And you can write to the RTC to save that. Next we have selecting between IEC or IEEE. You can use this as an IEC device with a Commodore 64 or VIC-20 or IEEE 488 with the PET. Here we have the LCD contrast. I have it turned all the way up. You see the range of adjustment here, holding it down. It appears to be adjustments kind of mid-range and if you go past the end, it goes back to zero. Select and save and brightness and you can see the P not moving but it'll still wrap around to zero save I've got it hooked up to the pet now so let's turn on the pet and take a look when I turn it on you'll see the display indicate interface clear that's detecting the reset from the pet as it powers on let's see how this works we have a directory some of the program files in the root of this SD card, but you can also see there's several directories. So, how do we get to those directories? I'll show you. So this is why it's nice to have a display. Browse files, and then just pick the folder you want to go to. Pet disk one, there we go. Unfortunately, with the way the firmware is laid out, once you select the folder, you have to back all the way out. Return to main menu, exit. If you try to read anything from the disk while you're still in the file browser over here, you will get a device not present error. So you have to return to main menu and back all the way out by exiting menu. And then we get a directory of the subfolder pet disk one. You can also get into a D64 file the same way to browse files, change directories. I have a folder in here full of images. Let's pop down to pet software and choose this D64. You can see the files that are in there. And now you can see what's in that D64. The next thing I want to do is to put it in this nice 3D printed case that I got. The case is designed to look similar to a uh, Commodore dual floppy drive. Take off the back here. That fits on here, but it's a little tight. I'm going to have to uh, 
get out the file and file down the uh, sides here in this opening for the reset button so that it doesn't hold it down. This hole for the reset button, I'm just going to use an X-Acto knife to deburr this a little bit. Open it up a little bit so it doesn't end up pressing on the reset button. The button is dragging on the bottom side of this hole here. It's not holding it in at the moment, but I still want to open this up a little bit more down here. So open up that hole a bit more. There's a visible gap all the way around it now. And what's more is I can push the button with my finger now. So, let's do a test fit here. There are a couple of lenses, or three lenses up front for the LEDs. And I just put those in there and taped them in. Put the SD card in there. The uh, screw holes on the bottom are lining up. So we this piece on, line it up with the slots, now the LEDs have pushed against the front a little bit, the screws are not lining up with the holes, it feels a bit tight, like it's pushing forward. The SD card slot is fine. But I think the LEDs are pushing against those lenses. Because the buttons on here can be activated not only by pushing down but by pushing to the side, the kit includes these little things for pushing the button. So you push in on the front panel and it activates the button anyway. So I put it together without the back plate on, and without the back plate you can see that the LEDs are not pressing hard up against the front. The buttons all move quite freely. SD card slides in just fine. All the buttons are good. And the screw holes line up. Snap it together. The problem is that with the back plate on here, it's pushing too hard against the uh, PCB. I'm not sure if I can even get it in there. You can see here that the power connector here and the PCB here are through this slot right here. So I think I'm just going to leave the back off. This, um, this 3D case was made for an earlier version of the board. This board appears to be a few millimeters deeper in, uh, in this direction. And the power connector is pushing into this slot here. The PCB is well into the slot on this side, so I just don't think this is going to fit in there. And leaving it out avoids any chance of the IEC cord interference here. The, the, it makes the reset button more accessible, so I think, uh, I think it looks just fine like that. I am missing one screw and the kit included some rubber feet to put on here. 
It's, uh, I don't want to put them over the screw holes, but uh, put them on the bottom here to uh, keep it from sliding around. Here it is together with the big brother. Looks kind of smart, doesn't it? The unit itself is not very heavy. It doesn't have much weight to it, but the connector does. The rubber feet on the bottom actually really help hold it in place to keep the cable from moving it around. So that's nice. And while I'm testing, I want to see how well it works with the Commodore 64. So I have an SD2 IEC already, which works fine. I'll take the SD card from that, pop it in here. Connect the IEC and turn it on. Gonna need to change the mode from IEEE to IEC. And change the device number. Eight. And see how it works. I have the fast loader installed at the moment just to see how it works. Let's just do a that looks right. So the file browser that's normally used on the SD to IEC will not work on uh, on this device. I've tried it several times now. We can use the file browser here to change directories. Let's pop into the C64 and the directory games and we have an image file for Super Mario Brothers or Portal. Let's try Super Mario Put in that image. There's a Super Mario Brothers directory. Let's see if it'll work with fast load. And no, it does not appear to be working. Check out the fast load cartridge. Try to load. Try a different game this time. Castles of Dr. Creep. Busy light still on. Two minutes for loading. This one seems to be working. Loading simple basic programs doesn't seem to be a problem. This is just a demo off of the 1541 demo disc. So, even though the PET SD Plus does work with the C64 and the VIC-20, I would not recommend it for use with those. The file browser doesn't work, and problems loading some games, including more modern games. You can see with the SD to IEC, you can load things like Super Mario Brothers, no problem. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.